Hello, hello, family. Welcome to this week's edition of the Extended Cut. With me, as always, Pastor Chris. What is up? Good to be with you, sir. Good to be with you. And with you. And with you. (laughs) And also with you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, the Extended Cut is our weekly moment where Chris, myself, whoever's preaching, sits down and we have a conversation about... Uh, just diving a little deeper into our sermons topic, the ideas, different takeaways. Sometimes it's expanding more. Sometimes it's getting into things that we couldn't fit on Sunday. Um, we're really grateful that you tuned in with us, excited to have a, kind of an extended conversation about this. Yeah. So before we go any further, I want to encourage you, if you've not listened to Sunday's message yet, go check it out. It's called Thriving in Babylon Wisdom. This is the concluding message of our Thriving in Babylon series, which is really great. It's been an awesome conversation set for our church over the past six weeks now, something like yeah. that. And uh, yeah, so before you go any further, go check that out. Thriving in Babylon, wisdom. Wisdom. All right. Well, let's kick off our conversation, Pastor Chris, by just doing a little recap. It's been a few days. What did we talk about on Sunday? What did we talk about on Sunday? Well, like you mentioned, we we kind of tied a bit of a bow on, on our series and We did that by talking about one of Daniel's most evident characteristics, and that is his wisdom. He lived a life of wisdom. And like most of these weeks, in order to dig into that wisdom or humility or hope or whatever it is, like we got to come to an understanding of what we're talking about, right? And so we talked about how knowledge is great and should be valued, not idolized like it can be in the West, but valued. Um, But wisdom seeks to take knowledge to the next level. Mm -hmm. And so we did a little word study, if you will, but we we defined it and uh, we broke down that knowledge is the awareness or familiarity of something gained by experience. And then wisdom is the capacity to make good use of what you have learned. So to take and apply when needed in due time that knowledge. Um, So what you receive or learn through an experience that then you apply and help that to make an impact. Mm. So um, we, we broke that down and how wisdom goes beyond a point of just knowing something or understanding something, but it actually makes a difference mm. and an impact. Um, and then we talked about the three avenues of Daniel's wisdom, not the only three, but we talked about three avenues um, of Daniel's wisdom that were powerful tools for him in exile. And the first was power of perspective. Uh, Daniel was able to recognize that not every challenge or point of discomfort that he encountered was worth dying for. He knew the difference between an issue that was personally distasteful or offensive or not preferable and an issue that was blatantly sinful or forbidden Mm. by God. And he chose to draw the lines in the sand where God drew the lines and not move them or put them where maybe his preferences would draw those lines. He had a greater perspective of God's heart and um, his rule or law over certain areas. We also talked about the power of tolerance and how Daniel maintained relationships with people that didn't believe what he believed or think like he thought, and that tolerance biblically is actually allowing people to be wrong, mm-hmm. right? Not saying that nothing is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and we unpacked that, and that allowed him to be around godless people that lived godless lives, but still be a light in those dark places that eventually led some of the most wicked uh, human beings in the history of the world to declare his God as the mm-hmm. one true God. And finally, the power of being faithful and how Daniel remained obedient to God even when circumstances weren't looking good for him. He was put into a lot of different situations because of his allegiance to God that got him in a bit of a conundrum. But he knew that being obedient was much more important than finding temporary relief. And that it wasn't about winning every battle, but following God's battle plan along the way. And so, uh, you know, we kind of summed it up coming to the realization that when we live with a godly wisdom, a biblical wisdom, um, that we can't underestimate the kind of impact we can have wherever God has us. And the power of a small light, maybe one of our lives, standing in the gap in a dark place and how that can change the trajectory of of an environment, Mm -hmm. of a family, of a workplace, of a city, of a nation, like that it, it is powerful and it does matter and encouraging folks to to move forward with that. Mm. So. 
That's great. I really enjoyed this message. I thought it was such a great culmination of just so many thoughts and ideas that we've been talking about and kind of wrapping up with like, you know, these last three main subjects we've hit in this was like, uh, what was it? Humility, hope, humility, and wisdom. Hope, humility, wisdom. Yeah. And uh, so this was a really great topic to to wrap this up. And uh, well, let's just go through our normal questions yeah. and talk a little bit more of your experience putting this together, and then any other things that have been kind of floating through your mind as the week yeah. has gone on here. Sounds uh, good. Let's uh, flip the order. We usually ask this question: What brought you the most joy in putting together this sermon this week? Hmm. That one's actually harder this week. Mm. Um, not because it wasn't a sermon that was good news and yeah. was was hopeful, um, but there's there's something about um, the process, and we talk about this almost every week. There's a process in coming to a place to preach this stuff, and so um, in that, I think the joy um, actually came after the message and in the responses mm. and the ways that people's hearts were were affected and when you talk about things that you know are going to rattle people's cages and be paradigm shifting um to hear a mature christ-like response from the people that you care about and that god's given you the opportunity to to share these words with um brought me joy um in putting together the sermon it was joy in being obedient mm-hmm. <laughs> i mean in the middle of my message i was like I've been asking God to let me pull this out of the sermon, but we're going there, right? And so um, there is joy even when it's hard in knowing that you're just doing what he's calling you to do. And so those were two of the main ways I saw that this week. And I don't know, it can sound weird to someone who maybe doesn't put together messages and, you know, share hard things with people. But that that was what brought me joy this week. Yeah. No, and I, I think that makes sense. And what I think is so great about how this sermon series has like resonated with people's hearts is that no part of this message has tried to preach that like either one of us leaders has got this figured out or that like our church is best at this kind of thing right like this has not been some sort of message that's trying to be like highlight oh look at what we're good at if only the rest of christianity (laughs) would catch up like it's like this is stuff we gotta work on yeah and it's stuff we gotta preach to ourselves and stuff we gotta work through and there's a lot of joy in in figuring that stuff out, working through it as difficult as it is to see it resonate and and work in yourself and in the community around you. It's it's really exciting. Yeah, I think when people receive these types of messages with humility, it yields camaraderie yeah. because it's not a like, oh yeah, I got this figured out, but you need to work on that. It's like, whoo, yeah, we need we need each other yes. to to live um, to live this way. And so I'm I'm excited for what I believe is going to be yielded, what the outcome of that will be in our community as we continue to have conversations in small groups and, yeah. and interpersonally. So That's great. Well, what was most difficult for you in putting this together? Yeah, I think I, every week um, this one was definitely one of those where there's a lot of death to self in the things that I was preaching to be able to like share them in a way that wasn't either being a hypocrite or just like laced with my own fleshly like yeah. frustrations or things that like maybe I see, but it was like, here's God's heart. Yeah. <laughs> and that can be hard to do because there's no such thing as a blank slate of a human where you're not it, it, living out of your experience and your thoughts and your frustrations and, and whatever else it may be. And so um, I was sharing this with my wife, like I hold a high reverence for the pulpit, if you will, right? Like the the opportunity to share God's word. And so um, just making sure to, that my heart was pure and yeah. fully inspired um, and obedient to God and, and delivering things that can be hard for people. Like when your pastor gets up and says, yeah, the world's very intolerant of Christianity and we're the ones to blame. Like, there are churches and places and environments where people would walk out with yeah. something like that. And, but like God honors that. And we need to have a realistic, consistent view of the things and what they yield. And that helps us unpack perspective yeah. and wisdom and humility, really like that ties into last week, but it just, it needs to be said. Yeah. And um, those things aren't 
fun to work out all the potential outcomes in your head while you're putting them down in your message. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. Oh, that's really good. So with each kind of point in this, as you were talking about, like the power of perspective, the power of tolerance, the power of being faithful, there was a lot of great examples and contextual information that you pulled from the life of Daniel and from others in the scriptures mm-hmm. that that you use to kind of show how this plays out biblically. And then obviously you lay it out in a way that's practically for our lives too. But what is something that's kind of stuck with you? Are there any of those examples or contextual things that um, maybe like really resonated with you more than others that you've been kind of thinking about? Hmm. I think, I think the tolerance one just really hits. And I think tolerance is linked to perspective and living out a lifestyle biblical tolerance over time as being faithful. So I think they all fit together, but as a father who has just sent his kids back to school in some crazy times and where you can have a lot of anxiety and fear about what may be being taught, your parents aren't even allowed to volunteer in the schools because of COVID protocol. So it's like this insulated place where you're entrusting your kid to people you've never met yeah. and whatever is, is being taught and all that. But um, that there can be a lot of anxiety around that, but the opportunity to empower our kids as disciple makers and as lights of the gospel in those places really has just been resonating with me. And I can go into those environments and demand syllabus and, you know, um, curriculum packages so that I can see if I approve and I can try to sign my kids out of classes that I don't agree with, or I can say, Hey, here's what we believe. Here's what the Bible says about this. Now, go pray that God would give you even one kid in that class that you could speak hope in the midst of this stuff too. And the idea of when we are intolerant that we end up like yielding our right to be light in the darkness, really like that really resonates in that, that sticks. And there's so many areas where the tendency is to reject things because it's icky. It's not biblical. It just doesn't feel, I I don't want to be around that. But the reality is we serve follow, submit to the kingdom of a God of redemption, not rejection. Now, there are things that he rejects and forbids, but we need to know the difference. And he has called us to be conduits of his good news and his living hope in the darkest of places. And so (laughs) we have to submit to his leading yeah. as by his grace and his wisdom, he places us in these, in these environments. Yeah. And with humility, with a hope of what is to come and with a wisdom that gets the bigger perspective of any given day and not freaking out because our kid comes home and says, Hey, I learned this today. This kind of made sense. Well, let's talk about that. Yeah. Not, ah, you know, right. like let's, let's talk about that. Because the reality is they're going to get that at some point in their lives. And I'd rather them walk through, through it while they're under my roof and while we're living together and we have these dinner table environments and whatever else to walk through things in. So I think that was a really um, relevant part of of this message to our everyday life that really can be applied in an immediate way. But that also happens in the workplace, Mm -hmm. right? It can happen in in all different places. Social settings. Yeah, I have a friend who played hockey, a strong Christian dude. And the locker rooms were not places that, like, oh, this is really edifying yeah. language. Right. This is just, oh, I just get the warm fuzzies. Like, but is he going to earn the right to be heard by those other people by saying, you guys, you're really offending me. Can you please stop? Right. Or is he going to earn the right to be heard by being a faithful community member in that, not being of that, but being in the midst of it yeah. and caring about people? And when the opportunity presents itself, say, ah. Sounds like you're really going through something. Mm. Would, would you like to talk about it? That's the wound, but you don't get that yeah. by putting up walls because you're offended or because something hurts your feelings or you think that by associating with that, that God's judging you. Right. God's people and Jesus himself associated with those that would have been judged by religious leaders. So yeah. do we yield to religiosity or do we yield to Christ-centered relationships in the midst of darkness? Yeah. Right. Soapbox for the day. Yeah. No, That's kind it. of sticking with me if you can't tell. Yes, a little bit. I love it. No, and it's so true. I mean, Christ is our perfect example. Like he entered, I mean, like seriously, even just simply like, 
He entered into the world. Like he became one of us, like a low human when he was like with the father, like not having to be in the mess of what we're doing. Like God initiated being with us, coming to our level in order to enter in with us and redeem and save us. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, where, where do we get off thinking that we're supposed to be different? Yeah. And yet he wasn't of all the things that right. the human condition was of, right. but he became like relational and walked in those shoes, but walked in them a different way. And yeah. that's what we get to do in the darkness. Yeah. We get to exist in that in a different way. Yeah. Some would call that holiness. It's mm. called faithfulness, right? Like you can, yep. you can put whatever you want to it. Yeah. Well, that's great. <clears throat> Were there any other additional application points or any other kinds of thoughts or ideas that have been kind of just sticking with you a little bit as you've been processing this? Or maybe even just in the context of this Thriving in Babylon series at large as we kind of uh, wrap up our conversations around this besides our life groups happening later this week and different things like that. Um, We are going to have a lot of opportunities to be like Jesus having dinner at Matthew's house or Levi, depending on what gospel you're reading, where the Pharisees are standing at the door saying, what are you doing associating with these people? You have a someone who has abandoned their cultural identity and become a Roman tax collector as a Jewish person whose family has disowned them and you're sitting in their house. This is blood money that has paid for this opulence that you're around and you got fishermen. Like, But Jesus knew there was something to be done in that environment and that these were people that God had set apart and that he had called them to reach. And so um, like Babylon looks different for different people. Yeah. If you're working at a university, your modern-day Babylon may look different. You may have to stand up for different things. And if you're working at a hospital, if you're working in a ministry, or if you're working in a school, whatever it may be. But the reality is a godly perspective says, how can you be a light in the dark, not how can you be in the most bright place? Yeah. <laughs> and I believe, and you know, I hope I'll still say this in 10 years, I believe living in a modern-day Babylon is amazing news because it's where we get to see Jesus work and not us. It's where we get to see his power and not a Christian culture's power. And I know a lot of people loathe that idea that we're not the dominant, like cultural influence. Um, But I mean, when you look at Constantine and how that whole thing unfolded, it's like, that was like a really bad thing for the church when he made it the de facto religion. Right. And there is something about being, um, humble and not being in a position of power that really like separates the wheat from the chaff. Like there is no question who is a disciple and who is following Jesus. The only question is who's the next one? Yeah. Who's the next one? And so if we as a, as a like God honoring, like Jesus following people can consider it good news, have the perspective that yeah, it's a modern day Babylon. There's a lot of like, a lot of harvest to happen. There's a lot of people that are far from God. There's a lot of people living in darkness. And God's given me the opportunity to be a light there. I just, I see it as a win. Yeah. Not as an easy thing, but like, I say this all the time. I just don't have many things that have been significant in my life that I would say, that was easy. Yeah. Yeah, that was comfortable. Like, right. anything of significance, any relationship, any meaningful friendship, Anything that I have done by the power of God in my life has never been easy, but yeah. it has been worth it and it's meaningful and it makes an impact. And so I think we have an opportunity. Agreed. I don't think this is a victim seat that we hold. I think it's one of great opportunity and great responsibility. Yeah. And I think there is a, a temptation to over time to get discouraged as we uh, have maybe like a long-term relationship with somebody that we've been walking through waiting for this this kind of connection this moment the turning point with king darius or king nebuchadnezzar like you're waiting for it you're waiting for it but it's it's so worth it to remain faithful to be in those people's lives to walk yeah. with them to be the shoulder that they they can turn to in desperate times and moments and and who knows like you never know what's going to be the moment yeah, that, yeah. that somebody finally is is humbled to the point that they say, I, I need God for this. I can't do it myself. Yeah. But if we're not in those situations, if we don't maintain those relationships because we're putting up all of these 
boundaries around those people. We're not going to get to be there in those yeah. times when, when people are ready to submit their lives to Jesus. Yeah. And you can't control their response, but you can control how you interact with people. Like yeah. you, you can be responsible for that. And I'm just constantly reminded that the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. And like the a, a successful farmer has multiple fields. They don't just try to squeeze the most out of one little field. They're always like they're diversifying. They have more land, more territory. And it's never a question if, if there is a harvest out there. It's a question of will there be enough workers? Right. So don't put all your eggs in one basket all the time. Like, yeah. oh, once I get it figured out with this one person, then I'll move on. That person may just need to see other people come to Jesus around mm-hmm. you and get around them. And that may, like the harvest is plentiful. And I think we forget that. And we try to just white knuckle the one like, <laughs> you know, piece of wheat. And yeah. that's, there's so much more out there than that. Yeah. And so. I don't think it is a time to sit and wait and be passive about this. I 100% believe this is a time to be full bore into what Jesus is calling us to do. I don't think we'll regret it. Amen. That seems like a good place to wrap up the conversation on. Agree. Well, family, thanks for tuning in with us today. Uh, As always, you can continue these kinds of conversations in our life groups. These are spaces where we talk about this kind of stuff. And uh, we continue on the conversations through our interpersonal relationships. And we get to dive a little deeper, talking about the implications in our personal life, all those different great things. And so thank you for tuning in. And we invite you to continue on these conversations in life groups with with your friends, with your spouse, by sharing this with somebody that you think would be relevant or encouraging to. But thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next week. See you next week.